All right, raise your hand if you had any form of education outside of the United States. All right, you guys put your hands down, you're still on my thunder. We're not talking about you, we're talking about me today. All right, so today I'd like to illustrate for you the basically typical day a student encounters at school in a foreign country such as Israel. I uh, moved to Israel in 2002. I spent two school years there, so four of the years of my teenage years. And mostly what people know about Israel is probably the conflicts in the Middle East between the Israelis and Palestinians. But what most people don't understand is that Israel has one of the most strenuous and rigorous educational curriculums in the nation. With that being said, I'm going to outline a few aspects of their education. Uh, three parts. I'm going to go through the commute to school, which people may overlook over here. The emphasis on a very, very rigorous education system that focuses on science, technology, and emphasis on language. And then the third one is military obligation. All right. First off, I'd like to start off by saying the commute. Waking up in the morning, you don't look forward to seeing a gun in your face quite like a bowl of cereal. It's not exactly the thing to get your day started. But that's what you encounter in Israel. You wake up, you walk to school, because most of the schools are within a quarter mile distance, so everyone walks or either takes the bus. And the first thing you have to go through is a checkpoint. Even this for you and Guy had to do it, but part of the procedure is you go up, you hand over your passport or your papers, they have to go in, check your visa. Then they ask you a series of questions, like you'd be at an international airport, they'd ask you, are you here for business or pleasure? I don't think anyone ever goes to school for pleasure. But you'd have to stand there every single morning, Monday through Friday, and answer these questions. And then they frisk you. They check for, obviously, like little guns or slingshots. Slingshots are big over there. You get rocks and just make them themselves. And it's very nerve-wracking and anxious, and it's not part of the morning you'd like to wake up to. You're like, I'm going to go learn something. I'll wait. I'm being questioned like I'm a terrorist or someone oh, somewhat profiled. But it's part of the day. And now that you see airport security is pretty much four plate compared to this. <laughs> Let's go on to meat of the subject is basically the educational curriculum. Its curriculum is actually the second most yeah, it's the second most rigorous in the uh, entire country. According to a report by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or unpronounceable acronym for short, <laughs> Israel is the second most educated nation in the world, and it's estimated that 48% of its population actually has a university or college diploma. We're only, uh, they're only second to Canada in that aspect. Another aspect of their undeniable passion for education is their emphasis on language. They put an emphasis yeah, to actually take three languages part of the curriculum, which is Hebrew, their national language, Arabic, which is their secondary national language, English, which is basically the international language, and then you choose an optional one, which in my case was French. Can you guys guess what that says? Okay, that's Shalom in Hebrew, that's Marhaba in Arabic, and Bonjour. The majority of the population of the Palestinians know all of three of these languages, plus a fourth one. Which is kind of impressive because, I mean, we take Spanish here maybe a year or two, and to be quite honest with you, all I know is como So, next part of our education is the engineering and scientific emphasis on there. Uh, they're actually placed third in the nation when it comes to medical technologies. And the most popular one is probably the pill camp. It was actually developed by Given Imaging, a manufacturer in Israel. And if you're saying, man, that's really crazy, what's that? It's exactly what it sounds It's a pill camp that you digest and takes pictures all the way down your esophagus and your entire digestive tract. It's designed to record images, and then you move it out. And then you take the images from that. And if you're thinking this educational system is actually way, way too intense, uh, you're probably not even getting to the part part yet. They have something called conscription. Conscription in Israel is basically a military obligation. You have to serve in the military for at least a year if you're there for five years in the educational system after you're 18 or if you were born in Israeli city. After your primary education, then your high school education, 
you have to go in, either go to school and you can defer your duties, or go immediately and then go to college. But there are a lot of exemptions to this. You can, sorry, you can actually go and take religious studies, which is the Torah in that case. You have to study for three years of the Torah to do away with one year of military obligation, which, I don't know, I guess it makes sense for some people. But after that, there are also other ones like physical and psychological grounds in which you can be exempt, obviously. And then you can be very, very famous and popular. And then that way you can get an exemption. An example of that are these two gals. Oh, sorry. That's the Torah. Oh, I forgot about that one. But yeah, you can study the Torah and be exempt from military duties, or you can be these two ladies. Natalie Portman was actually born in Israel, and the way she got out of it was donating a massive amount of money to different charities in Israel. And then to the right is Bar Raphael, a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model, and dated Leonardo DiCaprio. She also didn't have to serve in the military. But it must be nice to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so basically, So now that you have a basic idea of what an academic curriculum is in Israel, kind of have to take in the grant. Uh, we kind of take it for granted here that we do have the option of not being drafted into the army, and we can choose any language to take other than English. We don't have to learn three languages. But next time you wake up thinking that going to class is really hard or you want to skip class because parking is going to be a pain in the butt, just think at least you're not being frisked and have an EK-47 waiting in your face. And that's all. All right, Brittany, what did you think? <laughs> um, I thought that it was good that you were outlining um, what you were going over throughout your speech and um, that your visual ladies went along with it really well. The only thing that I would work on was um, after you showed the two pictures of the girls, I think you should have taken them down earlier because they're a little bit distracting to everybody, <laughs> like staring at the models instead of listening to the information you were saying. And um, in the beginning, you should have just told your personal story and then introduced the topic because you said something about, oh, I'm going to tell you about um, what it's like to go to school in Israel. I would have kept that after your like, personal story. Yeah, overall, I thought it was a good speech, and maybe just work on organization. All right. Uh, I think some of the subject matter that you get into uh, kind of diffuses the topic a little bit because it's really uh, about the surrounding experience, not just the experience of being in the school. So, you know, I was I was expecting a little bit more focusing on the school system and the curriculum kind of stuff that uh, you did talk about in the one section. I thought that's really what most of the speech was going to be about. I didn't think that there was anything problematic with what you included, except that it just didn't feel connected to the thesis that you uh, set up at the beginning of the speech. So it's, it's not like the information wasn't useful or interesting, it just doesn't fit the theme that you're talking about as well. Uh, I was also, uh, you know, the, for instance, the you had the uh, material about the different languages that students learn. I thought that was uh, very important and uh, applies to the curriculum issues and actually going to school. The material about the uh, pill cam, it, it's a very indirect relationship to the subject matter. It's a result of the education kind of thing. It's developed in Israel, but it's not really connected to how they teach the classes or how big the classes are or what the schools are like or any of those kinds of things. So it just feels like it's it's included because it's kind of connected to it, but it's a very indirect sort of connection. It's something extra. Same thing with the uh, opening and the closing sections, too. 
Um, it's pretty well organized. I like the uh, introduction. You know, I'm not a fan of the audience survey as an attention <laughs> device, but I like the way that you kind of tricked out the audience survey and turned it into a joke. You know, uh, you dumping on the two guys who were saying, oh, hey, you know, stop stealing my thunder because I'm going to be talking about something like that. And I, and I thought that that worked pretty well. There's a good twist on that. I could use a little bit more source citation. I know you're using a lot of personal experience on this, uh, but uh, for instance, even in that last section, when you're giving us all the ways in which somebody can get out of having to uh, serve their um, uh, time in the military, I don't, I don't get any reference to uh, you know, the, the military codes or procedures or any authorities who are saying this. This is basically you saying, well, Natalie Portman, she just donated a lot of money. and. This other woman, she's just hot, so you know she doesn't have to serve. Uh, my guess is that there probably are exemptions. I mean, you said there are exemptions. Do we have a list of those exemptions? Are they available for us to discover any place if we decided, you know what, I'm going to go spend uh, five years working on my PhD in uh, Israel, and damn, that's going to mean that I need to do a year of service there. How do I get out of that? Well, maybe it's on some website someplace that you could give us that explanation. I think that would be helpful. Uh, the visuals I thought were okay. You probably could skip the title card at the beginning. Uh, one of the problems is that you, because you have it up there, you're going to see uh, you have that nice star of David across your face most of the time for the first part of the speech. <laughs> you know, because that you just happen to be standing right there, and so it's you know, not on the screen. It's on you, and uh, I guess that makes you a star, the center of attraction in that particular case. But that looked a little bit awkward. And like I said, I don't think you really needed that first one. Uh, the, the other slides that you use are primarily just for um, structural purposes and transition, so we're getting from one point to the next. The one that did illustrate and organize a little bit was the different languages that you indicated. I, I like that. It was interesting also as kind of creative in the way that you were talking about what the standard languages are that people learn there when they're there. And then you also used, you know, I chose French also, and you talked about that. And I like the way that you kind of made a comparison to the United States and our academic system. You could probably find some statistical information on this. So, for instance, uh, Israelis, like you said, uh, the vast majority of the population speak, I think you had a statistic at one point, didn't you say like 75% of the population speaks three languages at least? So we need a source citation on that. And it would be easy, I think, if you, with a little bit of research to com contrast that to the United States, where what percent of the population here speaks two languages, that shouldn't be too hard to find. And, and you know, you have your personal experience on that also. You, know, you don't remember any of that Spanish that you took for one year, except como esta, uno burrito por favor, dos cervezas, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you.